Now, home is a lot of work. Just plain work. When work at home is planned and organized for cooperation, there can usually be more time for leisure. I'm certainly in favor of those things. Leisure, fun. Who is it? Wouldn't we all be happier if we worked out a little system for living together in harmony? But how can we manage them? We'll have to work out the full answer together. Say, Mom, it's well. Most family problems can be solved through frank and friendly discussion, which points the way to a happy family life. You know, this is beginning to be quite a family project. It certainly is. Last week, we started a brand new series about families. And we learned some pretty important key points, if you want to follow along with us in your notes. What we discovered is that uh, most of us do not have an, uh, a perfect family. Oh, good. I'm not alone on that one today. Most of us have imperfect families. But what we learned is that our imperfect family does not disqualify us from our Heavenly Father's calling. God has a plan for you, and wherever you came from or whatever kind of family that you have does not necessarily disqualify you from exactly what God has called you to do. And the reason why is because we, we found out that while our family is imperfect, our God is perfect, which is beautiful because that means that our perfect God uses our imperfect family to grow his perfect eternal family. Now that is a mouthful, but basically God has a bigger plan for eternity than our imperfect families. He wants to make the family of God, the church of God, perfect so that we can all be together with him for all of eternity, amen? So one more time, our perfect God uses our imperfect family to grow his perfect eternal family. And what we started with was this very imperfect family in the book of Genesis. I mean, they are messed up, guys. I mean, I know sometimes we look at our families and we go, ah, we're pretty messed up. No, these guys pioneered what it means to be a messed up family. And wait till we get to the third generation next week. It's going to be really crazy. No holds barred. Okay, so, but this week we're going to be talking a little bit about the second generation because last week where we kind of left off was Abraham and Sarah, the patriarchs of our faith, were really trying to help God with the promise he gave them. And so there was a com competition going. Instead of living in the covenant that, that God had for them, they started to compete with the values of God and said, well, God, let us do it on our timing and in our way, and we'll help you out a little bit. And it was a complete disaster. It completely ruined the family. So now we're going to pick up with the restoration, because God had to hit reset on everything because I'm reestablishing my covenant with you. I'm reminding you of my covenant. This is not over. We're going to get this right. So the promise finally comes in Genesis chapter 21. If you want to open up the book of Genesis, we're going to camp out there all day today, okay? Genesis 21. Now, the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. So remember... God is, is going to get the credit for this because he's going to do it his way and in his timing, and it's all going to work out finally. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. I, this is funny to me because it says in his old age. She's no spring chicken. Y'all with me here? They're both old. They're both in their 90s. Y'all with me now? I feel like I was just trying to wake you up with that one. They're saying, in his old age. That's cute. At the very time God had promised him. And Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. Now, there's a lot of context. And what I'm going to be doing today is not reading all of this for you because there's a lot in the book of Genesis that we're going to cover today. So I'm going to paraphrase a lot of scripture for you. But let me tell you really quickly why they named him Isaac. Isaac means laughter. Because when God told 90-year-old Sarah 
you're going to have a baby this time next year. She just, like, yeah, right. She laughed because wouldn't you? She's like, that's hilarious. There's no way. So God said, well, you're going to name him Isaac because I heard you laughing. And she goes, I didn't laugh. Yeah, you did. So when Isaac was born, he was named Laughter. Because sometimes when, what God is doing in our lives, when we first hear it, it sounds a little funny, doesn't it? It's like, God, I just don't think it's going to work out the way that you said it's going to work out. And he just, okay, let time tell and trust me. But here's what happens. When God gives you a family, now, now everything has changed because it's not Abraham and Sarah anymore. It's Abraham, Sarah, and the promised child, Isaac. And he is the promised child. He is the one that God said, hey, Abraham, I'm going to make nations out of you. Try and count the stars in the sky. You can't. There's going to be more uh, in your lineage than the stars you can see in the sky. That's what it's going to be like. And here's the promise. Here's Isaac, and he's born. And now you really have to determine for your family what your set of values are. So every family has a set of values that define the relationships. And that's what we're going to be talking about, the values that we choose for our families. Every single one of us has family values. Now, here's the thing. Some of us like to think that we have family values that we might not actually prescribe to. Because family values are learned either directly or indirectly. Now, you can't say that there's a family without values. Every family has a set of values. Sometimes we just don't take a step back and evaluate ours. But you value something as a family. Today, I'm hoping you're taking notes and you're figuring out, okay, what is it, God, that I value in my family? What does my family value? You will either learn Values directly or indirectly. Directly are the things that you say. Indirectly are the things that you do. So here's what happens. Sometimes we say that we have a value as a family, but our actions might not directly or indirectly reflect what we say. We say that, hey, our family serves God and we're going to do this, but our actions might not be reflecting that as a unit. Let me tell you something about your kids. The impact of your indirect lessons is going to be far more reaching than the impact of your direct lessons. They're not always going to remember what you told them. No, let me scratch that. Most of the time, they're not going to remember what you told them. You know how I know this? Because as I'm preaching today, I expect you to forget 90% of what I say. My kids are worse than you. <laughs> so are yours. So you're going to say a lot of things as your values, but your kids are always going to remember what you did. And here's how we win the values. When we're teaching them indirectly, the same things that we're saying out of our mouths directly and those things line up, that's how they know it's a true value. Because anything other than that becomes a conflict and a competition. So now we have a competition like we talked about last week. Is it covenant or competition? Now we have a covenant uh, in our family, but we're trying to adopt values, and we're saying one thing, we believe this as a family, and we're doing something that is in conflict with that and now in competition with that. So your kids are going to grow up going, well, what do we really believe? And they're always going to lean towards what you do, not what you said. Y'all with me now? Everybody is now awake and sober. <laughs> so where do we start with our values? Where do we start with our values? I think let each family value begin with something sacred that we seek to protect. If we're going to value something, let's value something worth valuing. Let's start with what is sacred, identify what is sacred in our family, and identify what is sacred in our lives, and say, okay, I want to protect that, I want to value that, I'm going to pay the cost for that. 
And as we begin with these, these things that are sacred, it will begin to inform our value structure, our value system. That way we don't end up valuing something that might not really have any value in the long term. How do we know what is sacred? Well, we're informed by God what is sacred. He gives us markers for what is sacred. Some of it is intuition. We, 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 we talked about um, uh, this earlier in the year back in, I think, February. We did a whole sermon series on sacred. If you want to find out more about what's sacred, go back and watch that. But in Genesis chapter 22, I want to start painting a picture of some of the values that happened in Isaac's life, some of the things that he was told and some of the things that he witnessed. And I think it builds values into this patriarchal family that we can learn from. So we're going to be jumping around in Genesis a little bit, and I'm going to kind of fill in the story for you. So Genesis chapter 22, it says, sometime later, after Isaac was born, God tested Abraham. Now, this could be... mm, Let's kind of find a medium between theologians about 13 years of age for Isaac. Isaac's probably somewhere in his early teens, somewhere around there. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And always when God says your name, the best response is, I'm right here. I'm I'm ready. What does that say? When When you're saying I'm right here, you're saying I'm ready. So when God says your name, say, hey, I'm ready. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Like, Are we clear? Don't take the other one that that we talked about last week. That was problems, right? We're We're not asking you to do this. Let's be specific. God is very specific in our lives sometimes, right? Because sometimes we'll try to negotiate with God, and God doesn't give us the room to negotiate. He goes, no, take your son, your only son, the one you love, Isaac, in case you're confused. And go to the region of Moriah. Many theologians think that this is the same place that is now Jerusalem. So go to this place. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. What? This, this test got weird fast, didn't it? You want me to take my 13-year-old son whom I love? The one that I waited a hundred years for? And give him back to you? Permanently? Early the next morning, Abraham got up, loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. I mean, this wasn't just over the hill. He had to make a little journey. All the while thinking about, God, this is what you've asked me to do. Because sometimes we read this and we don't really look at the context of it, do we? We read, oh, God asked him to do something difficult. And then, oh, you know what? Within a chapter, it all works out. But that's not how it works in my life. When God asks me to do something really hard, I don't just wake up the next morning and it's all resolved. There's a, there's a process through which I have to go that I have to trust God every step of this process. That's the test. Because what he got up, he said, hey, servants, we're going to go worship God. Hey, son, Isaac, we're going to go worship God. That's all he's telling them. Abraham spent the morning cutting the wood for the sacrifice himself. Have you ever cut wood? He did not have a chainsaw. I'm, I'm trying to pull you into the context here. Abraham spent the morning splitting wood. For a sacrifice that in his heart of hearts he probably didn't want to do. That took time, didn't it? So we get so impatient with God. God, I wish you'd just go ahead and resolve this test right now. And God's trying to do something inside of us. And we're not working through the process that God has designed for us. God didn't say, hey, go to your local place and worship like you normally do. He said, I'm sending you a a cross to another place to worship. I'm going to make you travel on this for this test. 
Most of your tests are not going to be instantaneous. Not the ones that are really worth something, the ones that really hold value. See where we're going? And God has set him up for this. And Isaac's a pretty smart young man. Somewhere along the journey, he looks at his dad and goes, Axe, firewood. We're missing something. Dad, we're missing the sacrifice. Don't we normally sacrifice a ram? Where's the sacrifice? And this was Abraham's reply. See, we're getting into our values here. In verse 8, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb. We look back at that now as prophecy. Not just prophecy in the moment, but the lamb that is the ultimate sacrifice for all of mankind, God's own son, whom he sacrificed. That was a test that God passed so that all of us could experience life eternal is now being mirrored in Abraham's life. But the prophecy is a value that was deep inside Abraham already. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And that's remarkable. And let me just kind of give you a little preview of how this ends. Abraham leaves the servants and goes just up the mountain with only a son. Prepares the altar, places his son on the altar, raises his knife, and as it comes down, the angel of the Lord interrupts him and says, that enough. You proved your point. You trust me. You trust me. And I think there's some really important values in this. And then, miraculously, just as Abraham, we now know, prophesied, in the bush over to the side is a ram caught. They didn't even have to go catch the thing. God just provided it. Everybody say, that worked out. That's how you feel when your situation, when you fast your test, doesn't it? God, that was a tough journey to run through, and I was stressed out the whole time. God, I thought the knife was coming down on me on this moment. But then right at the right time, you provided so there's two values that I want you to know that, that Isaac had deeply ingrained in him throughout his life. One is this, there's no life without faith in God. There's no life without faith in God. This is the kind of value that Abraham could put his son, the promise of God, because he believed in the promise and he trusted God so much that he could place his son on an altar to God and say, God, he is in your hands. Do whatever you want to with him. That is a hard place. I am not going to pretend that I could be anything like the patriarch of our faith and put one of my children up on that altar in that same manner. But we see it was how he did this that was an example of faith in God. Because the truth is, living isn't really living if you don't have faith and a relationship with God. It's really just existing it's like a bad counterfeit of the life that God wants you to have. And Abraham, knowing this, is willing to lay it all on the line for this value. There's no life without faith in God. I mean, you could live, sure, but what kind of a life is it? Life only really begins when you have faith in him. And when you have faith in him, you don't fear death because life is now eternal. And then there's the second value. God provides when we demonstrate our trust. I mean, God could have provided before he put Isaac on the altar, but he didn't. He provided at the right time. 
God provides when we demonstrate our trust. And this is one of the things that's really hard to do, is to trust people. To trust God sometimes. And here's how you know that you trust. It's when you let go. See, if I ask you to hold something and I say, you know what, I'm going to trust you to hold this, and then I put it in your hands, and then I keep holding on to it also, am I trusting you? Not hardly, am I? When does the trust truly begin? God, I trust you with my kids, but I'm going to be a helicopter parent and I'm going to control their every action and emotion. (laughs) Y'all with me? God, I trust you with my money. (laughs) But I'm going to hold on to it as tight as I can. (laughs) It's not trust until it's no longer in your hands. And this is a hard value, isn't it? Because at that moment where we say, okay, God, you know what? I completely trust you with this. Then you watch him begin to provide. Because the problem is, if we keep our hands on whatever it is, it's not fully in his hands, and he's not really the one providing yet. It's not God holding up his provision. It's us holding on and holding up what God wants to provide in our lives. But we hold so tightly. Trust and let go. And this is incredibly difficult. This is incredibly difficult. Because what we're doing is we're establishing values in our life, aren't we? And a value is established at a cost. You will not have anything of value in your life if you have not paid the price for it. Parents, spouses, you want to spend time with your family. That's going to come at a cost. Parents, if you want to spend time with your kids, then it's going to cost them whatever they could be doing in that moment, isn't it? It's going to cost you time that maybe you could be at work or doing something else yourself. With everything that we value, there is a cost. Let me maybe explain it this way. What if you just said yes to your kids about everything? Let me tell you what that will cost you. First, your bank account. Because if you just say yes to everything your kids want, they will drain it. Because they don't know better. And then it'll cost you your authority as a parent. Because a parent that only ever says yes to their kid is not the one in control the kid is. One of the greatest values you can have as a parent is to know when to say no. That comes at a cost too, though, doesn't it? Oh, this is good stuff, isn't it? (laughs) What's the cost of saying no? You're probably going to hurt their feelings. Right? It's going to be a cost of emotion. Let me tell you why you pay that price. Because the value of what you're instilling in them is more important than what they want in the moment. And you pay that price for their good. It costs you something. Now, let's move on to another value that costs us something. Worshiping together with our families. We talked about this. 
Yes, there's a culmination of what we do on Sunday mornings, but every single day you should be looking at a place where you can carve out time and protect that time. Let that time become sacred where you're worshiping and engaging your family in worship. And I don't mean you have to have a worship service in your home every night where you're cranking up the worship music and stuff. No, talk about your family, your life, and Jesus around the dinner table every night. Is that too practical? Am I not being spiritual enough right now? But it is going to cost you something, isn't it? Because it's hard to make sure those things happen regularly. But it's worth it. And then we see really this concept in Scripture at the end of Sarah's life. In, verse, in chapter 23, verse 1, it says, Sarah lived to be 127 years old. She got to see Isaac grow up a good bit. What a gift. What a gift. She died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn Sarah and to weep over her. And this is such a powerful example in in Genesis 23 of, of how we honor people. See, we honor the people that we value. And let me help you with this. Don't wait to the end of someone's life to honor them if you value them. Honor them now because you value them now. And this is a very hard value to wrap our minds around, the value of honor. Because this is a very selfless thing to do. It will cost us something to honor someone else. Usually our own time and our resources. And this is what happened. Abraham goes into this land where the Hittites are, and he's talking to the Hittites. And and Abraham is a wealthy, powerful man at this point in his life, and everyone respects him. No one wants to go to war with Abraham because they remember how he beat up the four kings. And he was a lot less powerful then. Nobody wanted to mess with Abraham. Everyone respected him whether they liked him or not. And he goes into the Hittites' land, and he says, hey, I want to purchase this place because this is the best place for me to bury my wife. I want to honor her by purchasing this place, and and it's in your territory, it's in your land, but this is the best place for me to honor her and create a tomb for my family. And the Hittites, out of respect, say, oh, no, 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 no. You know what, Abraham, just have it. Just what, what is it between me and you? No big deal. You know what? You just, you carve out, you tell us how much of that land you want and you can have it. And Abraham refused. This chapter just keeps going back and forth between him and the Hittites talking about, no, 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 no. How much is it worth? And he's not just talking about the person that owns it. The person that owns the land is now in a court, kind of like what we have in the room right now. All the leaders of the city would be standing at the gate of the city. And this is how they conducted business in this times. So he's like in a court of law. This is an official setting. And he says, no, I don't want you to just give it to me. It's far too valuable. This is where I want to bury my wife, and I'm not going to put her in a free grave. I want it to cost me something because I love her. Do you get that concept of value and honor? And finally they go, well, it's probably worth 400 shekels, and he goes, count it out. (laughs) And they literally said, well, it's probably worth 400 shekels, but what is that between me and you? And he looked, he just kind of ignored them at that point, looked at his servants and goes, count it out, give it to him. You know what's amazing about that? He purchased the deed for this, and he made it his tomb. This is where Isaac and Ishmael buried their father, Abraham, later on. This is where Isaac and his wife, Rebekah, are buried. And this is where Jacob, his son, and his wife, Leah, are buried. To this day, people still visit this tomb called the Tomb of the Patriarchs. 
I have to believe it was because God honored the way that Abraham valued this. He said, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to pay the price for this. Because this is not going to just be in my family for our generation. This is going to be in my family for a few thousand years so far. And then Abraham buries his wife and basically does the last thing that he can do for Isaac is make sure he marries a good woman. And this is one of those, this is where we're going to kind of end up with the values that we set for our family. I want to tell you this, following Jesus is the most important decision in your life. And your marriage choice is a close second. What do I mean by your marriage choice? Well, first of all, you have to choose whether or not you want to marry. And you're going to marry. And then you better make sure you marry the right person. And that doesn't mean that there's just one perfect person. If you don't find that person, you're ruined for all, you know, serendipity hates you. That's not <laughs> biblical at all. But it is the person that you choose is the right person. Because that's a decision you make. Not just something that falls in your lap. Now, your marriage is a very important decision. And look at how Abraham sets this up. In Genesis 24 and 7, it says, The Lord, the God of heavens, he's telling his servant this, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying, To your offspring I will give this land he will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. And let me tell you what's happening. Abraham looks around the, the land of Canaan, which God had promised him and his heirs to inherit. And he looks around going, these women are trash. <laughs> if you don't believe me, go read it. I, I challenge you. He looks around and he, goes, he looks at his servant and goes, I don't want my son marrying one of these women. They serve all these pagan gods. They do all this weird stuff in worship. And no, this is not happening. So I want you to go back where I'm from. Find a good girl. Bring her back. That's exactly what happens. But here's the value in this. Give your marriage decision the value it deserves. And if you think I'm only talking to single people right now, who I'm not. Give your marriage decision the value it deserves. Let's first of all talk to single people. Single people. If you're not now praying for the person that you will marry, start today. Pray for them. You probably don't even know them yet. Begin to pray for them. Begin to pray for yourself that not only that God introduces you and things work out, but that God is making you into the spouse that you need to be. Or that person won't give you the time of day. Take the decisions seriously. Put value into it. And when you find the one, don't just date to date, date to marry. Give your marriage decision the value it deserves. Now, let's move on to married people. All the single people say amen. <laughs> married people, give your marriage decision the value it deserves. The one you married is the right one. <laughs> don't have a plan B you guys with me you've already made the decision now value it man you valued it when you were making the decision they could do nothing wrong they were perfect y'all never even fought I love hearing that in premarital counseling. We don't even fight. Well, you will, and my job is to make sure you do before you leave today. <laughs> 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 
Signing up for premarital right now. Anybody wants to. Um, <laughs> but you've given all this value going into it. And so often we get into the marriage and real life begins to hit. And we don't value it the way we valued it before we experienced it. Let the value of your marriage decision grow with each and every day. Your wedding day is a baseline. Value should grow from there. And that was the last thing that Abraham did for his son Isaac. He did. He made sure he married a wonderful woman named Rebecca. We're going to talk about their imperfect family next week. <laughs> but this is how it ends for Abraham in chapter 25, verse 11. It said, after Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac. See, because God was blessing Abraham. And when Abraham died, he began to bless his son Isaac. That blessing kept moving down. And this is what I want you to leave with today. The idea of what values are outliving me in my family? Because when Abraham died, there was literally nothing else that he could do for Isaac. It's now on Isaac's hands, and Isaac had to take the covenant that he was passed down, and he had to take the values that he was passed down from his father, Abraham, and he now was the one holding those values. What values are going to outlive you in your family? You're not going to be able to instill those values in your last moments. All you can do in your last moments is remind them of those values. You instill those moments now. Some of us, we have values in our family that might, we might need to break apart so that we can replace it with better values, more God-driven values. It's a good time to start now. Your family will appreciate that because those values will outlast you, whatever they are. So this is what I want you to leave with. Leave a legacy that blesses. Leave a legacy that blesses. Abraham died. God was blessing Isaac. The blessing that Abraham was going to be to all generations is now the blessing that Isaac is going to be to all generations. It outlasts. It outlives. And whatever your values are in your family right now, they will outlast and they will outlive. So would you stand with me today? Here in just a moment, we're going to go back into worship. We're going to reflect on what God has put in our hearts today. But this is what I want you to reflect on. God, what are the values? What are the things that my family holds value? What, what are the things that we think are worth it? What are the things that we put on the pedestal? What are the things that we think are most important? God, help me reprioritize the values of my family so that their values that when I'm gone leave a legacy that blesses my family, blesses my kids. I wanna leave my kids with as many blessings as I possibly can, the greatest of which is having a relationship with Jesus. Everything else is secondary to that. I want them to be strong in this crazy, hateful world. I want them to shine with the light of Christ and love. That's not going to happen by accident. It's going to be a value that I teach them. It's going to outlive me one day. And hopefully it outlives them one day and is instilled in their kids. So would you bow your heads today with me? Would you just ask God in your own words 
to help you sort out the values for your family. Father God, right now, I stand before these people. God, I know that my family is not perfect. And God, I, I, I believe that no one in here can claim theirs is. But God, I think we hold to some values that are given to us by a perfect God. And God, I want those values to shape my family's thinking. I want those values to shape my family's actions. So God, I pray for every single person in this place and every single person online right now, that God, you would help us take an inventory of the things that we value the most. Take an inventory of the things that we put priority on, God. Take an inventory of the things and God, help us understand, God, that we can step into those values and help us understand the cost, God, and give us the strength to pay the price for the things that are more valuable. God, the things that become everlasting. Because God, when it comes down to it, you alone are worthy. God, you alone hold greatest value in my life. Let your values be my values and my family's values. From this day forward, in Jesus' name we pray. Would you lift your hands as I pray blessing over you? Father God, I pray blessings over your people today as their pastor. God, I pray that you... You bless, they're rising up, they're lying down, they're coming in, they're going out. God, I pray that you bless them with favor as the light of your face shines upon them. God, I pray that you bless them with health and strength for their journey ahead. God, I pray that you bless them financially as they continue to be generous to others. God, I pray that you bless them with the greatest of all blessings, the honor, the privilege, the opportunity of introducing someone to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. This week, I pray in Jesus' name.